So this whole section now, uh, this uh, from t now to lunch, will be about not so much the right ventricle but the load that it carries in the pulmonary circulation and in particular that terrible group of illnesses called pulmonary hypertension. Uh, this is a, a territory which crosses from cardiology through to respiratory medicine uh, but also particularly pertinent in the operating room. It is one of the few things associated with instantaneous death, uh, critical pulmonary hypertension on induction of anaesthetic. It's one of the things that anaesthetists fear the most uh, of uh, the surprise diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. And indeed we had a, a, a death during a, a neck, neck of femur a week or two ago in somebody with known severe pulmonary hypertension, heroic life-saving surgery but, but uh, pulmonary artery pressure of 100 and as predicted catastrophic failure during general anaesthetic. So this is, this is not for the faint-hearted, uh, pun intended, uh, this uh, pulmonary hypertension condition and so let's have a think about it. So. The world's changed in pulmonary hypertension, it's evolving and it's evolving for two reasons. One is we're better at measuring it and two is we've now got drugs. We've got drugs that can actually do something about these terrible, terrible conditions and uh, so all of a sudden it, it matters and in, in the old days pulmonary hypertension was a palliative care condition uh, with very little that we could do uh, whereas now we have interventions uh, both pharmaceutical and so on that can help. And so the brand new guidelines from the European Society of ECHO meeting last year in London, uh, European Society of Cardiology, I'm sorry, in London last year we all went to. These new brand new guidelines were released uh, for the classification, therapeutics and, tr and treatments of pulmonary hypertension. And I commend these to you that are on the ESC website. This is the gold standard now. This is the language we're all going to speak in pulmonary hypertension land. So the pulmonary artery uh, should have a blood pressure of less than 30 over less than 15. That's what you, you and me are walking around with. Less than 30 over 15 is our pulmonary artery pressure with a mean pressure of less than 25. Remember the mean is sort of the average across systole and diastole. And so it's supposed to be less than 25. In fact, you and I walking around have a, a mean pulmonary artery pressure of about 14. And the definition of pulmonary hypertension everywhere now is if you've got a mean PA pressure greater than 25. Remember, we don't measure mean PA pressure in the echo lab but that's what the definition is in terms of drug trials and in interventions. And, uh, right heart catheterization, which we're going to have a whole lecture on in a minute, uh, is the gold standard where you put catheters up from the groin or from the arm or the neck and you measure the pulmonary artery pressure which might for example be 25 over 8 millimetres of mercury with a mean of 16 and the old fashioned nomenclature in scientific notation is if you've got a bar over the top of the number it means it's an average number or a mean so the way we used to write it would be 25 slash 8 slash 16 with a line over the top of the 16 that's what that means so you and I have a mean PA pressure say of 16 and a mean left atrial pressure of 9 millimetres of mercury, 8 millimetres of mercury or whatever. You can't measure LA pressure very easily unless you do a transeptal puncture so we use a Swan-Gans catheter, you'll hear about that in a minute, with so-called wedge. And by wedging a balloon right there you're connecting the end of the catheter past the balloon to the left atrium via the veins, uh, via the capillaries, I'm sorry, and therefore the wedge pressure equals roughly the left atrial pressure and that's what we do all our, 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 our ambulatory measurements on. What is the step down pressure across the lungs? That's what counts because if you've got something wrong with your lung arteries there will be a substantial step down in pressure from the, from the lung arteries to the pulmonary veins slash LA. And so that you, you and I have a mean PA pressure of 16 millimetres of mercury, we have a mean LA pressure of 9 millimetres of mercury so the TPG or transpulmonary gradient and that was mentioned this morning in the VAD talk, the TPG is the mean PA pressure minus the mean wedge pressure. So in this person 16 minus 9 or 7 millimetres of mercury. You only drop 7 millimetres of mercury of pressure from your pulmonary artery to your left atrium. That's a normal kind of a thing. More recently people have been measuring the DPG, the diastolic pulmonary gradient, which is that 8 number minus that 9 number and in this case it's negative. That is to say in the end of diastole the pressure in the pulmonary artery is actually less than the pressure in the left atrium. How can this be? Blood would be flowing up a hill but remember what happens at the end of, of diastole when, that, when you, when you pulse um, pulmonary veins is you get a reversal. Blood does indeed go backwards at the end of diastole into the pulmonary veins. That's why you get a wave reversal because there is at the end of diastole a negative pressure, a backwards going pressure from LA to PA. 
And then if you divide all the, the TPG, the transpulmonary gradient, divided by how many litres per minute are going through the lungs, that will give you the PVR, or pulmonary vascular resistance. So the TPG is a pressure measurement, measuring the step down pressure, and the PVR, the pulmonary vascular resistance, resistance, is a flow dependent measurement of the pressure drop across uh, the pulmonary circulation. So here is the classification of, of uh, pulmonary hypertension. Can you just quickly write that down? <laughs> okay, that's enough. And, but it basically falls into, even though there's five groups, there's basically two groups. The first group is that terrible, terrible condition which we all grew up with knowing as PPH, primary pulmonary hypertension. It's now been renamed as PAH or pulmonary arterial hypertension and it's got several subcategories there, it's not important. But this is a terrible, terrible condition, used to be of young women mostly that we would see this, typically in the uh, late teens, early twenties, where for some reason that nobody understood they would start to scar off and fibrose their lung arteries, uh, destroy their pulmonary vascular beds and make a very, very high TPG with right heart failure. And this picture is everything. Oxygen on, sad face, pretty young girl, no life in front of them and a mortality rate of 100%. They all died and they often died in, in pregnancy because you increase cardiac output but they all died and there was nowhere to go. And some of my saddest memories in medicine are in fact of these young women dying in our coronary care unit 20 years ago. So what's, what's gone right though is the development of drugs called the, the Santans, Bosentan, Mesotantan, those sorts of things which are basically specific pulmonary vasodilators. You can call them specific blood pressure pills for the lungs. And all of a sudden we've got a medicine which actually will work to vasodilate the pulmonary tree and relieve some of the obstruction to flow and gives these young women, and in fact many other demographics now I'll talk about in a minute, gives these young women somewhere to go and some sort of hope. And the, re and the, and the evolution and revolution of these drugs which, uh, of which there are many now and also some other more complicated things which are drips and so on, has turned a, a mortal illness in something that can be lived with or prolonged. So these young women and all the people like them have so-called pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension. So pre-capillary means there's something wrong with your capillaries. So you've got fibrosis, obstruction, sclerosis, something wrong with your uh, pulmonary arterial tree and you can't get blood across the lungs. So you have a very, very high PA pressure, but a low or normal LA pressure because you can't get any blood there, and therefore your TPG transpulmonary gradient is very high. This is pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, and these are the people who will do well with these special drugs like Bosentan. Unfortunately for the world, much more commonly, is the other sort of pulmonary hypertension, which is pulmonary hypertension as back pressure from left heart failure. And so in these people, which constitute 10 to 1 numerically, the, uh, the number of people walking around there in the world, either because they've got a bad ventricle or mitral stenosis or, or huff puff or any of these things that raise your LA pressure, you get very, very, very full left atrium, full as full, as full which causes back pressure through the uh, pulmonary capillaries to make pulmonary hypertension. So a high LA pressure causing a high PA pressure. This is so-called post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. That is, it's after the, the, the lung vascular bed that your problem is. These people don't respond to uh, the pulmonary vasodilator drugs because they don't have a problem with their pulmonary tree. These people respond to Lasix. So these people, you have to empty their left atrium to reduce the back pressure effect, post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. So one group of people, one of these groups of people, gets a $30,000 a year drug, and the other, other people get an $0.08 cents a day drug, Lasix. So it's pretty important uh, to get it right, because you don't want to be wasting the expensive drug on people who don't need it, but more importantly, you do not want to let one of these folks with pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension go home uh, missed. So how do we do it in the, in the echo lab? You're going to hear about the cath lab in a minute, but in the echo lab we use TR. TRV max times 4V squared of TRV max, the most time honoured of our echo numerics. And we do this all day, every, way, every day, and we can do it in about three quarters of people, and in fact in people with pulmonary hypertension we can do it in about nine tenths. 
But how do you measure it? Because we often get it wrong and often when we send our folks to the cath lab and you guys do the cath and they go, oh, it's nowhere near as high as you guys said, you're dreaming. Um, it's because of this, the beard and the chin. Where, when you get this fuzzy kind of uh, uh, overgained uh, kind of appearance, it's very, very tempting to measure the bottom one. Uh, but in reality, what you actually want is the chin. And if you look at this, and we analyse this ourselves, if you look at the chin, it lines up very nicely with the right heart cath. If you look at the beard, it's clearly overcall. So set your gains and all those gates and those other filter things that Bonita will teach you about. Set them so you get the chin. As well as just measuring TRV max, there's other things like right ventricular uh, expansion, septal bowing, uh, and uh, other changes uh, in uh, in uh, the 2D and 3, uh, 2D and Doppler appearances. This is all in the, in the in the notes uh, about whether or not you've got pulmonary hypertension. Because remember, not everybody has TR, so sometimes you have to use the force a bit and figure out whether there's other ways you can pick whether you've got TR. So let's say you've got pulmonary hypertension, and then you're trying to figure out whether Mr. Bloggs in front of you is pre-capillary or post-capillary. And this is an idea that we we're working through. So there's two sorts of people in the world, those who've got pulmonary hypertension above the line and those who don't. And there are two sorts of people in the world, those who have a high LA pressure and those who don't. You and me, we're all these people hopefully, normal LA pressure, normal PA pressure. Then you've got people who've got pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, a normal LA pressure but a very high PA pressure. These are the lung people that need Bosentan. Over here you've got the people who've got post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, high PA pressure and high LA pressure. And then there's a group of people who've got high LA pressure but haven't had enough back pressure yet to make pulmonary hypertension. We might call them huff puff. So I had the idea that we can uh, measure RVSP by TR. We do that all the time. And we can measure, we can estimate uh, uh, LA pressure using E to E prime. And so like we do in echo all the time, we divide everything by everything and we come out with something. <laughs> and uh, here's what we got. So we thought up this idea of EPLA, which is the echocardiographic pulmonary to LA ratio, which is the TRV max, which is basically PA pressure, divided by the mitral E to E prime, which is basically LA pressure. And uh, we came up with a number. So let's see what that plays out. So you and me, TRV max, 2.4 metres per second, E to E prime about 8. So our EPLA would be 0.30, I'd like to say 0.30 metres per second. That's a normal one by definition. People who've got the pre-capillary version of this might have a TR, let's say, of 4.4 metres per second. I'm just making this up. E to E prime of 8, let's say. And so their E plow will go high to 0.55. They will go to the right of this um, numeric. And people who've got the post-capillary version, the ones you want to give Lasix to, not Bosentan, they will have a TRV max of 4.4 metres per second, same, for example. And an E to E prime very high, let's say 20. So their E, e plow will fall low, say, 0.22 i.e. lower than the normal range. So you, you diverge higher if you're pre-capillary, you diverge lower if you're post-capillary. And these folks over here will have the lowest numbers at 0 0.12, but let's just stay with the pulmonary hypertension people for now. So graphing it out, that's normals we'd expect. This is the uh, pre-capillary people we'd expect. This will be the post-capillary people we'd expect. This is how we thought it would go. In fact, thought up on a, on a, during a lecture like this uh, on the back, back of a napkin. So why should it work? Well, because it t it's basically looking at TPG and LA pressure. Both of these things should roughly line up. The TR does roughly line up with RVSP. And here's an example of, uh, we did uh, some of our own, and it does, and LA pressure does roughly line up with E to E prime. Not too bad correlations. And so E plus should roughly correlate with TPG, and it does. These are pressures, and E plus is in metres per second, so 4V squared of a metre per second is a pressure. That's how echo works, so it's understandable. And there's, this is taking measurements from both sides of the heart, so if there are some vagaries in each person, it might cancel out. So we did some of this. We analysed it at 133 people who had right heart cats, and we found that the pre-capillary people came out to about 0.36, and indeed the post-capillary people came out to about 0.20, with a cutoff in this group of about 0.26. So all of a sudden you've got an echo thing which can do what you can do uh, in the cath lab and that is differentiate the people who need Bosentan and go to a pulmonary hypertension unit versus the people who need Lasix and go to a heart failure unit. And it, and it turns out that it had a pretty good uh, cutoff uh, predictability. Now it gets more complicated than that, of course. 
And it turns out that within the postcapillary people, the heart failure, old folks with postcapillary pulmonary hypertension, that with the passage of the years, they also get fibrosis and sclerosis of their pulmonary arteries, uh, a bit like Eisenmenger people do wreck their pulmonary arteries. And so they can start to develop obstruction across their pulmonary tree, secondary to all this years of back pressure. So they've got both. They'll have both increased LA pressure and increased TPG. And these people actually uh, need both Lasix and a pulmonary vasodilator drug potentially. Uh, and, and although we've not used uh, Bosentan for these people, they have had sildenafil with some benefit. So therefore, the ESC guidelines now differentiate those people who haven't done this yet, so-called isolated postcapillary people, who have a DPG less than seven, you'll just have to take that on spec, versus the people who've started to build up obstruction of their pulmonary tree who have an elevated DPG or TPG, i.e. pulmonary vascular obstruction. These people will need Lasix and some sort of pulmonary vasodilator drug, and in, in Australia we've used sildenafil for this. So we had a look at this and we did some uh, caths of these people and uh, just splitting down now the, our post-capillary group, we actually were to able to show that indeed the EPLAR was lowest in the people who have isolated post-capillary and as you start to tighten up your pulmonary circulation, you move to the right a bit, to, a bit towards the direction of the post-capillary people. And that, to be, that is yet to be determined with the value of that subtle, more subtle differentiation. We then went and had a look at 16,500 or so normals and we, did, we ruled out a whole bunch of bad things and we got their TR, which slowly climbs with age, divided by their E to E prime, which definitely climbs with age, and we found that the EPLAR falls slightly with age, with, as I said, the average being 0.30. So the guesstimate of what the average of EPLAR was was in fact co completely correct. Uh, when we looked at it at 16,000 people. But as expected, it does fall a bit with age because in general, you get higher LA pressures as you get older. So let's have a look at a couple of examples of this. Here's one of these ladies with PPH or PAH or that terrible illness. And so she comes into us with a TRV max of 3.6 metres per second, an E to E prime of 8, so an E plar of 0.45, which as I said, is far to the right hand side towards precapillary pulmonary hypertension. The cath guys would have got this right, we got this right, she gets Bosentan, it's the right drug for it. And the, the demographic's right, it just, it, it's all right. One month later, after giving this magic tablet at $30,000 a year, her TR's fallen from whatever it was, 3.6 to 2.5. E to E prime hasn't really changed. So her E plus fallen from 45 it was, 0.45 down to 0.35. Back towards normal like it's supposed to be. And indeed, one year later, TR's 2.1, E to E prime is the same, and so she's now plum in the normal range. This is the effect of giving this, this very impressive drug to this otherwise terminal patient. And we've looked at this and in fact analysed a whole bunch of people who have been on Bosentan and shown that same sort of effect. Whereas if you give Bosentan by accident to basically the post-capillary people, i.e. who started with a low EPLA, they have very little effect, they basically stay neutral in terms of their TPG. Now we don't tend to do right heart cast repetitively on people who have Bosentan, so this, as well as choosing who needs the drug, we might be able to use the ECHO now to follow the treatment. Here's somebody who's got scleroderma, came in with an EPLA of 0.28, which for their age was basically within the normal range, so we couldn't tell whether they, they were, they, it was a big, a big hefty old, uh, older gentleman, so it could have been left heart, it could have been related to his scleroderma, but we walked him on the treadmill, for better or worse, and his TR went up to 5 metres a second, the E to E prime didn't change, and the E plar moved up substantially, suggesting that this guy's problem when we increased cardiac output was all about his transpulmonary flow, and most of his problem therefore was lung related, so stress E plar in this situation. Anything you can do at rest in echo, you should do in stress. Um, the flip side, of course, is this is somebody who's got left heart failure, so 4.2 metres per second of TR versus, versus 27 of E to E prime, and so this is very, very low, exactly what we'd expect in a, a little old lady, say, with uh, heart failure, with preserved ejection fraction and pulmonary hypertension. The treatment here would be Lasix. And so the LA pressure was high in this one, TPG was only 11. You'd expect also that in acute pulmonary embolus, e plus should go up dramatically, as does TPG, because all of a sudden you go from being a normal human to having no blood going across your lungs with a big pulmonary embolus, so you suddenly and acutely put your TPG up. Interestingly though, because their right ventricles aren't trained, somebody this morning was talking about trained right ventricles because they've had a chance to build up their strength, the RVSP is often not very high in acute pulmonary embolus, 
And so their TPG goes up, but their right ventricle fails out on them. So sometimes, many times in fact, their TR is not very high when you get these people in your echo lab query acute pulmonary embolus. So we had a look at this in 67 people, and we actually found that on average, 67 people with submassive or massive pulmonary emboli still only had a TR of 2.7, which we all would say was in the just at the top limit of the normal range, 2.7 meters per second. RVSP is about 35. Yet, when you looked at their EPLA, because they've got a very, very low E to E prime, because no blood's getting to the left atrium, you know, they've obstructed their lungs, their E plas were very high as a group at 0.4 metres per second, well above the, the range that says you've got troubles with your transpulmonary flow. We had a look at this and we found that there were uh, about a quarter of people that E PLA and TR were both negative, that is low pressure, low gradient, probably pretty small PE. There was about a quarter of people who had a high pressure in their RV, RVSP and a high transpulmonary gradient. Probably everybody would have got that right. There were a few people uh, that uh, EPLA got wrong, but there was 45% of people found by this test who had a normal TR but had a high EPLA or high TPG, which we would make the diagnosis of uh, substantial pulmonary uh, embolus, embolus effect on their circulation, which would have been missed by TRV max. Here's one for example. TR 2.5, E to E prime 6.4, e, e, the uh, E plus very high at 0.39. We would have got that right. I'm going to move on because we're just running a bit low on time. AF, the message is that you have to be careful with AF for beat to beat variability. What else is out there? PVR uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Marwick and other folks have got PVR formulas in ECHO and they are good but they are vulnerable to the vagary of the pulse wave Doppler of the RVOT which is a relatively difficult thing to get sometimes and has all sorts of interesting shapes. There are a variety of algorithms with using RV size, RA size, E to E prime, LA size and a bunch of other rules a bit like a CHAD score to try and work out whether you're down the pre-capillary end or the post-capillary end and that's also a very good thing to do but I think that you can see that that's very complex and our E to E prime is, uh, sorry, E power is very simple. Um, there's MRI and that doesn't look scary at all going into that machine uh, when you're having your pulmonary embolus but there are a bunch of MRI characteristics uh, that uh, can be seen in acute uh, in pulmonary hypertension. So to summarise and to finish, ECHO uh, is by far and away the entry level test for ruling in or ruling out or even bringing up the thought that somebody's got pulmonary hypertension as the cause of their breathlessness. And for all its vagaries, RVSP is absolutely the way most people get in the door. It's very, very, very important to differentiate between precapillary, that is lung-based, and postcapillary, that is left heart-based physiologies, because the treatment is different and you absolutely don't want to miss a lung-based one, let it go through the wicket keeper, because you miss PPH, or you miss pulmonary embolus, or you miss fibrosing alveolitis, or you miss uh, other scarring illnesses and you could have given prednisone or you could have given bosentan or you could have given warfarin, then you really have not done the person a service. EPLA and other algorithms are going to help. The question is, is the amount of TR that I've got in this person in proportion or out of proportion to the amount of E to E prime I have? If it's out of proportion, I've got lung troubles. If it's in proportion, it's all just back pressure from the LA. And this test is obviously very easy, broad, broadly applicable. You can see TR in almost everybody, E to E prime in almost everybody. And we should be able to apply it uh, across the board in people all over the place. It will have a role in therapy, a role in triage, maybe acute pulmonary embolus. It will certainly have a role in the, in the observation of specific pulmonary vasodilator therapy and possibly offer new hope for these very sick people with these terrible, terrible illnesses. Thank you very much. <laughs>